In The Woke Danger 3, Collectivist Roots and Shoots, we followed the collectivist big state idea from Rousseau to Kant to Hegel and to Marx and out to the 1917 Bolshevik Revolution. I pointed to left and right collectivism. Right collectivism was dealt a significant blow with the defeat of Nazi Germany, but in America, uh, left collectivism was left to continue to percolate, and it, it certainly has. So now in this presentation, we're going to follow that left collectivism a little bit further to Gramsci and the Frankfurt School and critical theory, and we're setting the stage there for the, the postmodern crash, which will come in Woke 5, hopefully. Now to pick up where we left off, the big wonderful communist revolution uh, failed to materialize like they theorized that it would. So we got it, they got it in Russia, but nowhere else. This left the Marxist theorist very puzzled and trying to figure out what had gone wrong, what did they miss, why didn't this happen in Germany and in America and in the big cities where it's supposed to happen. So we now come to the individual that James Lindsay, the author of Cynical Theories, calls the linchpin between historical Marx and everything that's gone out of control, unquote. Gramsci was a major figure in Italian communism, and he was its foremost theorist. He was imprisoned for communist activities and spent a lot of time in prison. While he was there, though, he wrote copiously and came up with what are called the prison notebooks. Among the ideas that Gramsci came with was the idea of hegemony. One author describes Gramsci's viewpoint called hegemony this way. Roughly speaking, Gramsci's hegemony refers to a process of moral and intellectual leadership through which dominated or subordinated classes of post-1870 industrial Western European nations consent to their own domination by ruling classes, as opposed to being simply forced or, co or coerced into accepting inferior positions." Unquote. Gramsci's fundamental idea of hegemony is that the people in power use government and media to sustain and justify their being in power. They actually use the different resources to bolster their power and bolster people to thinking that everything's the way it should be. Whatever corruption, whatever's going on there uh, that isn't the way it should be, it's, it's effectively uh, taught to be normalized. People are lulled into acceptance of their situation. And so the reason that there wasn't this big communist revolution, Marxist revolution in the West was because, uh, allegedly, says Gramsci, that the people were just sort of taught that this is normal, everything's fine, it's the way it always has been and always should be. So they, instead of rising up and getting their, their uh, class consciousness and realizing that they should rise up and take over, they just have been lulled into not doing that. So the rich succeed by just propagandizing the, uh, the workers and they just continue to be exploited. Another person, uh, Glenn Sunshine, writes this as he's, as he's looking at Gramsci's conclusion. For social progress and the liberation of the worker to occur, the current culture and value system must be attacked and replaced with a new one that reflects the interests of the workers and, more broadly, the oppressed. Establishing this new truth is critical to human liberation." Unquote. That's the viewpoint that, that arises out of Gramsci's way of thinking. In fact, Gramsci himself wrote this. Quote, any country grounded in Judeo-Christian values can't be overthrown until those roots are cut. Socialism is precisely the religion that must overwhelm Christianity. And he went on to say, in the New Order, socialism will triumph by first capturing the culture via infiltration of schools, universities, churches, and the media by transforming the consciousness of society, unquote. That's pretty interesting stuff, isn't it? James Lindsay, referring to this, warns uh, in warns this, Gramsci understood 100 years ago that if you could subvert the church, you could remove the greatest impediment while creating the greatest delivery mechanism for the ideology possible." Unquote. Now Gramsci's focus on culture was embraced by the Frankfurt School, which we're going to talk about now. The Frankfurt School fundamentally reformulated the approach to communism and communist revolution. So remember now, so realize now that the plan is to work on subverting the West which is uh, not, not falling into the big uh, plan for uh, communist revolution. Now, as we mentioned, when the communist revolution didn't occur all over the place like it was supposed to, the, uh, the, a lot of these guys were trying to figure out why didn't it happen. And so this is, group came and they started an a, a institution in Frankfurt, Germany, and they came to be known as the Frankfurt School. So why didn't they revolt and implement the glories of communism? I've got a book here by Stuart Jeffries, Grand Hotel Abyss. 
and um, he is doing a history here from a, from his perspective positive of the Frankfurt School. And listen to what this extended quotation here from, from the book. The Frankfurt School came into being in part to try to understand failure, in particular the failure of the German Revolution in 1919. As it evolved during the 1930s, it married neo-Marxist social analysis to Freudian analytical theories to try to understand why German workers, instead of freeing themselves from capitalism by means of socialist revolution, were seduced by modern consumer capitalist society and fatefully by Nazism. They, that is the Frankfurt School, reconceptualized Marxism. And he goes on to say, they engaged with the rise of what they called the culture industry and thereby explored a new relationship between culture and politics. And then lastly this, in particular they reflected on how everyday life could become the theater of revolution. So you can see that the gears are turning, they're trying to figure this out. Let me describe some of these figures and the years they lived, just to give you, you know, the sense of it here. So we have Max Horkheimer, and he lived from 1895 to 1973. Theodore Adorno, he's in 1903 to 1969. And Herbert Marcuse, 1898 to 1979. A key move made in the Frankfurt School is the shift from the Marxist emphasis on production to this emphasis on consumer industry, or the, the consumption industry. They decided they would use culture to critique capitalism. So then the things got pretty hot in Germany and so the Frankfurt School people moved on and moved to America. Here's a little another insight here about what happened. The Frankfurt School had airbrushed terms such as capitalism and Marxism from its text while in American exile. It went on to say Habermas and Marcuse were seeking to reconfigure Marxism without the proletariat and without, as a result, the class struggle. And goes on to say, consumerism in the West had become the opium of the masses. And friends, where are we today? Alian Glaser writes this, When every single person on a train carriage is staring at a small illuminated device, it is an almost tacky version of dystopia. Digital consumerism makes us too passive to revolt or to save the world. In Grand Hotel Abyss, Stuart Jeffries says this, if Adorno were alive today, he might well have argued that the cultural apocalypse had already happened, but that we are too blind to notice. Well, next we come to critical theory, and we mentioned Max Horkheimer. He's the big uh, fellow who began to define critical theory. So here's the definition of critical theory. According to him, a critical theory is adequate only if it meets three criteria. It must be explanatory, practical, and normative all at the same time. That is, it must explain what is wrong with current social reality, identify the actors to change it, and provide both clear norms for criticism and achievable practical goals for social transformation. Now notice here, this isn't the traditional approach to theory. This isn't just about understanding. Horkheimer said, no, you, you, we're not just going to understand, we're going to understand, and then we're going to uh, build into this whole picture what are the very things we need to tweak and change and how can how can a person then change it so he's he's making it very practical or pragmatic but of course when you do that you pollute the uh, the purity of you know searching for knowledge and now you know any agenda can be imported uh, and to support you know we need to do this now you're gonna say this about this so anyway this is this is still the result and so critical theory uh, is taking not only trying to understand but it weaponizes the, the item that it's studying and tries to figure out how to change it. It's kind of built into critical theory. Now it's important to try to differentiate between cultural Marxist critical theory and postmodern critical theory, which we're going to be looking at postmodernism in Woke 5. But uh, here in Cynical Theories there's an important footnote here and I'm going to read it to you in, at length here. Here's what we have. Critical theory is mostly distinct from postmodern critical theory. The postmodern theorist adopted the critical method, or at least the critical mood, of the Frankfurt School and adapted it into the structuralist context, particularly its view of power. The critical goal remained the same, however, to make the problems inherent in the system more visible to the people allegedly oppressed by it, however happily they might be living their lives within it, until they come to detest it and to seek a revolution against it. The Frankfurt School developed the critical theoretic approach specifically to expand beyond critiques of capitalism, as the Marxist had been doing, and to target the assumptions of Western civilization as a whole, particularly liberalism, as a socio-political philosophy and enlightenment thought in general. It was this approach to critique that the postmodernists turned upon the entire social order and its institutions, insisting that hegemonic power structures, a concept adopted from Antonio Gramsci, exist across all facets of difference 
and require exposing and eventually overturning. They're going to critique all of Western society. They're critiquing everything that comes from the Enlightenment uh, period, the Enlightenment idea, and their plan is to just basically deconstruct everything, undermine everything, rip the rip everything out of the ground, every single thing, and overthrow it that way so that the people will f finally see that we, we need this uh, wonderful new utopian Marxist revolution. We just don't have to use the words communism or Marxist or any of that, but, but that's, that's kind of where they're going. And today we see a lot of this uh, flowing straight on. So there we have it. A little trip today from, uh, from the Bolshevik Revolution out here to right on the edge of postmodernism. Next time, God willing, we'll talk about postmodernism and uh, hopefully just one or two more of these and we'll be out of the, the uh, historical development and we can talk about finally the, the, the practical problems with it and some solutions against it. Hey, watch out because there's crazy stuff in your world, but that's what we're trying to get at here. So critical theory has its consequences. It's going to result in full-blown postmodernism, and that we'll discuss next time.